So welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the webinar on tipping forwards. Uh, we could have done this on, on a horse, but it's uh, freezing cold and really dark out there. So uh, we decided to do it from our studio. And actually it's a lot easier to, to demonstrate some of these techniques whilst not on a horse and also to get you to do some exercises too. I've uh, got my little saddle chair, which we can work with. Um, my name's Peter Dove. I'm the author of the book Master Dressage. And uh, just actually, just to get us all going, I'm going to give a, a copy of one of these away right at the start. Uh, I'm also a certified Ride of the Mind coach. And if you want to find out more about Ride of the Mind, go to wwwmary onelesscom And I think I'll get Claire to type that up for you uh, in the chat so you, you can know where to go. And if you're looking for one-to-one -one instruction, uh, then you can find a list of coaches on there and find somebody in your area worldwide. So my big promise to you today is that I will talk about the different ways that a person can end up tipping forwards and I shall give you some really good solutions to those problems as well. Uh, it, it won't be comprehensive because we could be here for quite a while even though it is only about one subject but you'll go away with some really good techniques and a really good idea of what causes people to tip forward and how to solve it. Uh, one of the things we've had in the past uh, when people are looking at dressage training TV is is the idea that dressage is perhaps uh, too difficult or too complicated or too high a level of skill but you know, dressage is based on a French word uh, meaning to train. And at Dressage Train TV, we train everybody right from the beginning uh, all the way through to competitions. So, you know, we offer uh, everything from how to avoid tipping forwards to, you know, how to get better marks in your score. And we do groundwork as well. And, you know, we work with quite a range of riders. So dressage shouldn't really put you off. It, dressage riders isn't just something dressage riders do. It's, it's really what everyone does when they're training their horse or even training themselves. So um, hopefully some of you uh, will have got the email from us, which we gave you a PDF, uh, which you can print out. And that PDF uh, has some room for you to make some notes and, and, you know, so you can follow along as we're doing this. So what is one of the biggest ways that prevents progress uh, in riding? You know, uh, why can't we make rapid progress? And I think the, one of the biggest problems is, um, especially, you know, when I see a rider come to me, is they imagine that they might have to change by, let's say, this much. You know, they, they're expecting to have some small incremental improvements. They're expecting to have their position tweaked or, or what they do tweaked. Um, and, you know, they can kind of accept that they might have to change perhaps this much. That, you know, they might feel a little bit pushed about how they're having to change their body and change their techniques and so on. But often what really is the case is the rider needs to change this much. And what happens when a rider has to change so much more than they're expecting is a lot of objections happen like this is too weird this can't be right i can't possibly be upright i feel like i'm tipped forwards or i'm leaning back or i feel like a, a hunchback or i feel really hollow in my back and you know um a lot of those things are simply your body telling you that this does not feel normal to you at all and you know often the body's really good at telling you uh where it is relative to where it's used to be. So, you know, if you were, if you're a rider, like perhaps the reason why you came to this webinar is that you tip forwards. When I finally get the rider upright and ask them how they feel, they will say that they're leaning back by quite a bit. And, you know, you have to kind of sell them on that leaning back. And, you know, I use things like uh, cameras and photographs and video and uh, get them in front of the mirrors that we have uh, to really convince them that, even though this feels the weirdest thing ever, uh, that this is correct. And, you know, I think as um, riders, we do often underdo the corrections that need to be made. You know, I think kind of the best pupils that, uh, you know, I make a correction to somebody and they come back two weeks later and they've overdone it. And I'd much rather have someone overdo it than, than underdo it. Because underdoing it often ends up being 
never quite getting there and then also losing heart because you don't see or feel the results that you really want. We're going to move on to uh, one of the ways that a person can tip forward and uh, th this is what I call rotating about the thigh. So if we, if we imagine myself sideways on um, and where my thigh is here, if you imagine there was a bolt going through my thigh, the rider can keep these angles the same. So in other words, I'm not going to tip forward from my waist, but actually what happens is the thigh does this and the rider ends up with the thigh too vertical, the lower leg too far back underneath, and sometimes the, the lower leg isn't too far back underneath, but the thigh ends up too vertical and the upper body is too far in front. Uh, and that's one of the ways a rider can tip forwards. They can be um, thigh too straight, body over the front. And of course, if I come back up, the knee comes up and, and we've pivoted you know, about this particular point here, even though I haven't collapsed or leaned forward or, or anything like that. One of the uh, ways in which a rider can end up pivoting around here is that they have their stirrups too long. You know, if your stirrups end up too long and your leg is too straight, often you'll find yourself immediately, ooh, crikey, the chair did something strange. There we are. You'll find yourself uh, immediately in front of the thigh. So one of the things that we recommend is that the rider uh, initially has the stirrup set so the thigh is at about a 45 degree angle. And as soon as you start getting that stirrup too long, it's going to be really easy for you to end up in front of your, in front of your thigh. So that's the kind of first thing. By the way, I'm kind of going through uh, the ways in which riders can tip forward and then we're actually going to move on to the solutions. So the other way a person can tip forward uh, is by closing the angle that the front of the thigh makes with the upper body. So that's just plain folding forwards like this. Okay, so we've got, we've got that one, <laughs> and we've got the thigh doesn't move, but the, the rider closes the angle that way. Uh, and then the other way that a, a rider can uh, tip forwards, and Millie, could you be over here to flip the charts, please? Uh, is is to collapse here in the middle. So th so this is usually the tummy gets pulled in, uh, the rider sort of rounds their back really and uh, tips forwards. So those are the three basic ways that a, a rider can tip forwards. And it's really important for you, uh, you know, if you're looking at yourself or even looking at other people and coaching, that you try and figure out where this person is tipping forward. You know, I is it the problem with the stirrup length? Is it a problem that they rotate around the thigh and the thigh changes its angle? So if you watch them tip forwards, you can kind of watch where the, the knee is and the thigh angle and so on and see what happens there. There are two other ways uh, that a rider can end up tipping forwards uh, that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, one way is simply through fear. So as soon as the rider becomes uh, fearful or scared, uh, they go into fetal crouch. You know, everything kind of comes up and, and they tip forwards. Um, the other problem is to do with the way you're holding the reins. So if you if your reins are too long, if you're kind of holding your hands like this, or you know you're pointing your hands down, you know you'll end up often with your hands too far back and your upper body too far forward, and also in a really sort of difficult, uh, unbalanced position where the horse can pull and push you around, and and you know it's just not a very good place to be. So it's really important uh, that you know your hands are out in front of you and your elbows are slightly ahead of the the midline here, and your reins are short enough. You know, too long a reins, and you could almost end up tip forward by default. Uh, interesting story. Uh, last week I taught uh, a lady called Gaylan on a, um, a fairly uh, exuberant um, horse. Um, and, and she was nervous, you know, she was a little bit nervous. She was doing a really good job of, of attempting not to show it, but she was pretty nervous up there. And, you know, one of the things uh, that we got her to do was to get the hands out in front, taught her how to do more neutral spine, taught her how to engage her core, and we'll talk about that uh, in this session as well. Uh, taught her about having the thighs out in front, uh, and again, that's what we'll cover as well. And, you know, once she learned to do all of those things, she had an incident where the horse went mm, and tried to kind of plunge forwards. 
And quite surprising for her and, and surprising for him, he essentially hit the end of the reign and Galen just didn't get moved. And she told me afterwards that that was a really uh, big confidence building moment from her because she would just be there in place whether the horse is going correctly or he's trying to move her around. She didn't get moved by him. And on, often part of um, not tipping forwards is learning how to correctly hold the reins, hold the contact and, and where to hold it from in your body. And, you know, we will talk about that. The other thing that is really important in being able to um, avoid being tipped forwards or backwards is having a neutral spine. Now, in lesson one on the How of Riding, a uh, course that we've got for members, uh, I cover alignment and neutral spine in there. But I'm just going to show you um, how important it is to have neutral spine uh, by getting Millie over here to do a demonstration. She's just giving me a funny look like, really? What? Uh, yeah, you can turn it over. So one of the problems about not having neutral spine, for instance, uh, and we'll actually start... Go really hollow for me, Millie. That's it. Oh, not, not as hollow as that. Okay. So one of the exercises we can do is if I was to stand behind Millie and to push down while she was not in neutral spine and, and in this case hollow, what happens is as I push down, she'll go extremely hollow. I haven't broke. Do you know, she's got such a flex of a back. It looks like we broke her in the middle. But the, the spine just doesn't have the strength and, and you end up being even more hollow um, because of it. Now go round backed. And we have the same problem with round back is, you know, the spine has no rigidity in it, no, fir no firmness, so that, you know, the horse can easily pull you around and pull you forwards. And if I go around to the, the front and we get Millie to do hollow back and put her hands out, and if I'm the horse and I pull, she'll easily get pulled forward like this. And if she goes round backed, her upper body gets pulled forwards to what... <laughs> <laughs> let's let's pin that in place. Uh, gets pulled towards me like this as well. Okay, thank you very much, Millie. You can go now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um. So you know, neutral spine is really important. And uh, for those of you that are members, that whole first lesson covers neutral spine. So you know, when when we're talking about core strength. Um, we're talking about core strength when you have a neutral spine where your front is the same length as your back and you know you don't have an excessive curve uh, and you're not collapsed here but the but neutral spine has a big impact on whether you're going to get tip forwards or not okay so uh, hopefully that made sense to everyone we're now going to go on to the solutions uh, for this one of the things that we teach people uh, who have the problem of the thigh doing this and who have the problem of folding that way is something called, we call slingshot. And it's the idea that the thigh is at 45 degrees and you're trying to keep the thigh out in front of your upper body. Now, anyone who's been... Uh, and watched any of our videos or been to any of our uh, webinars before, knows that we do talk about muscle tone. We do talk about core. And it's no good to kind of have your thighs out in front of you, uh, passive, flaccid, because they won't do anything. You know, your upper body will still go bleh, out in front of them. Um, so, here's a, so hopefully, if you can uh, sit yourselves on the edges of your chair, so we'll do a little exercise. So sit on the edge of the chair so that your kind of thigh hangs, uh, you know, down from the chair. <laughs> My saddle keeps slipping. And um, keep feeling as though the thigh is down out in front of you. And we're going to try a little exercise. I'm in hoping that you can feel your seat bones. And what I want you to do is to start pulling your seat bones back along your flesh as if you know you you end up you're going to end up sort of poking your seat out behind you so you'll end up quite hollow and you'll find your kind of knee comes backwards and your bum goes backwards like this and you'll end up actually probably tipped over the front of your thigh okay oh got a bit of cramp um now you're going to do the opposite what i want you to do is to reach the thigh away from you as much as you can and you'll probably feel your seat bones getting pulled forwards and the thigh reaching away like that. Now, bring yourself back to neutral 
and we're going to try something what we, uh, we call it slingshot. So that that's a sort of ride with your mind terminology. We, we call this slingshot. So if you were to imagine that uh, your, if you imagine a catapult, or in the US I think they call it a slingshot, uh, imagine that the the two points at the top are your knees, the elastic is your thigh, and the little pouch which holds the stones uh, is your seat bones. And you want to get the idea that you reach the knee away from you, but pull back off the seat bones as well. So you're trying to almost lengthen the thigh in both directions. Now when you get this right, there will be quite a lot of tone in the thigh. You will feel the thigh really tone up. And when you go for slingshot and keep the feeling as though the thighs act like a buffer and stay out in front of you, you will automatically feel that it is actually quite hard to tip forwards. Uh, the, the Having the thigh out in front acting like a buffer in slingshot where you feel the tone of your thigh will act as a very good buffer. If you let go and you know the horse throws you forwards and the thigh is too flaccid and too loose, you will just end up being thrown in front of it. So it's important to keep feeling thigh out in front and get this idea of slingshot. By knees reaching away but seat bones kind of pulling back, it puts you in a really solid place. So that really helps solve the, the knee kind of doing this and the thigh going too vertical. And, you know, uh, often when you've got horses which pull or try and lean on the end of the rein and try and pull you forward, this idea of slingshot is really important to keep you back and not getting in front of the horse. So the other problem we mentioned was the tipping forward from the waist. And I hope you can feel from the little uh, experiment that you did with slingshot of pulling back off the seat bones but reaching the thigh away as if somehow you could lengthen, that that would make closing this angle more difficult. Now, what you need to do as a rider is monitor this angle really closely when you ride. I think one of the biggest um, mistakes people make is to try and forget their mistakes as quickly as possible. What you might want to start thinking about is, how did I make that mistake? How did I tip forwards? Where did the tipping forward start? And when you do tip forwards, if you're the kind of person that folds this way, you want to, let's say it happens at a downward transition, at a typical place people tip forwards. Um, monitor that angle and see what happens. Does the angle close? When does it close? Uh, where does the closing start from? Do you start by starting to hollow your spine and then close forwards like that? So try and figure out what is happening to you now. And once you can kind of realize that perhaps that angle starts closing, you can start thinking about doing more slingshot, keeping this angle open. So you actually want to, as you come into the transition, you want to really make sure that the angle doesn't close and you keep it really open. Uh, and we'll teach you about core strength, which will help that too. Um, Another way that you can end up tipping forwards, um, when, uh, especially in downward transitions, is pushing into the stirrups. The moment you push down into your stirrups, you're going to push your seat out behind you, and this angle will close. Uh, I haven't f quite finished with that, Millie. Uh, th this angle will close really quite clearly. Um, yeah, you can, you, can, you can open it now. So it's important, especially in downward transitions, uh, that you do not push into your stirrups. And quite a lot of people do. The moment you push into the stirrups, the, uh, the stirrup is going to be like a pendulum, will swing forwards, and your upper body will close. So foot stays light in transitions. You stay focused with thigh out in front of you, monitoring the angle that the front of the thigh makes with the body. The final thing really, you know, even if, you've, if you're doing slingshot, okay, and you're monitoring that angle, if, if you're very loose and flaccid in, in your front and you don't have any tone or core strength, you will easily end up collapsing this way and that the tummy ends up being uh, pulled in. So you can be doing shoulders like crazy and everything else, but the horse will still end up pulling you forwards. So... Uh, we call, the, we call this bearing down. Uh, this is taught in lesson two of the How of Riding. And uh, this is essentially how you engage your core and stabilize your front. Now, uh, I'll, I'll work, go through the exercise with you, but I will warn you, it will feel like really, really hard work. Um, you know, I 
can bear down like I'm doing now and, and quite a strong bear down and I can still breathe, I can still talk to you, I can still ride a horse, but you know, uh, the, the horse isn't able to pull or push me around. In fact, that's one of the things that um, gave uh, Gaylan her kind of epiphany is that she is there ready. She isn't affected by the worry of the horse about to do something. She just focuses on being there in place and stable. And when the horse tests her, she's already in place and doesn't get moved around. And, you know, I think one of the things that we try to do as riders is not be reactive, but causal. So, you know, the horse pulls and then, and then we don't suddenly go, oh, God, God has got to put that right, must fix that. You know, we're already there and the horse pulls and it's kind of like, and they can't move us. Or they suddenly speed up and we just suddenly don't go, wah. Or they slow down and we don't suddenly go, wah. You know, as a rider, you need to be there already in place with a good core uh, and um, not get so easily moved around. So here we go. Uh, just put the uh, heel of your hand just underneath your sternum, press it in, and just go. <clears throat> now, hopefully, as you clear your throat, you'll find these muscles push out against your hand. Now, see if you can keep those muscles pushing out all the time. Uh, and what you'll find is this is diaphragmatic breathing. Now, we go into this a little in a little bit more detail, so we teach you how to activate all the way up the front wall. And by engaging your core and doing diaphragmatic breathing, when the horse suddenly slows down, he pulls against your body, or you, he, the horse suddenly decelerates. You don't get pitched forwards because you're doing slingshot, you're monitoring the angle here, you're bearing down, so that you've engaged your core and you don't get pulled around by the horse. Um, and this isn't just, you know, I, I say pulled around by the horse because that's the easiest thing to imagine. But even uh, surviving forces like downward transitions, uh, that really needs for you to be firm in your core. One way you can easily uh, test this is um, when you're driving in your car, if you just bring your back away from the back of the seat, Feel what it's like when you try to accelerate. What muscular force do you need in your core to stop yourself falling backwards into the back of the seat? And that kind of gives you an idea of the kind of tone that you will need on your horse. Uh, one thing I would say about tone and bearing down and, and having your core engaged is if you haven't done it before, it will feel like a huge amount of effort. And it will be one of those things where you go, Surely it can't be that. Surely it can't require that much firmness. Surely uh, this is too much effort. Well, you know, for a fit rider that's skilled and, uh, you know, rides several horses a day and so on, you know, uh, their level of core engagement to them will feel fairly negligible. You know, like almost there isn't much going on. But for us to kind of match the tone that skillful riders produce without a second thought, it will feel like an a lot of effort. And the other thing, too, is you, you don't have the core switched on at 100% all the time. It really depends on the horse you're riding, uh, the amount of movement that the horse has. I mean, Millie, you may have seen some of the lessons uh, on Dressage Training TV uh, of Millie riding Ella. Uh, Ella is a 16-hand uh, Dutch warm blood that moves beautifully with huge amounts of power. And Millie really does have to uh, create a lot of tone in herself to stabilize herself on that horse uh, and to stop it from throwing her around all over the place. Uh, I do remember the very first uh, lesson that we did when Millie got uh, her horse home. And we were laughing a lot about how much Millie got wobbled around on top of the horse. Um, but now, you know, uh, the kind of bonus is she, she gets on her 14-hand pony and now is able to produce incredible power from that pony because she's had to learn to stabilize herself more on the bigger horse. So actually, I will cover that uh, in, in the Q&A. So, so someone asked about uh, how to prevent um, going fetal when you're, you're anxious or, or worried. So I'll talk about that in the Q&A, actually. So if you can write that person's name down the question, that would be great. So, you know, that was a small amount of information uh, about one aspect of riding. You know, um, sit, sit up just doesn't cut it. You know, if you're, if you're um, paying for a lesson and, you know, you've got all this problem of tipping forwards and someone just says sit up, it, isn't, it doesn't help. 
You know, riding, uh, despite what some people say, riding is a complicated uh, f deal with lots of uh, detail to it. You know, that they're, they're, it just isn't stretch your leg down and sit up tall. There's a huge amount to it than that. If it was simple, we'd all be riding an awful lot better than we are. Um, so if you like that level of information, think about you know uh, what solutions there would be to leaning back, to you know a asymmetry issues of leaning one way or the other, to transitions, to turning, uh, to how to sit to the canter, how to get good canter transitions, how to do rising trot or sitting trot, uh, how to sit still, how to control tempo. You know there are so many questions and. Really, you know, there is only one biomechanically optimal way of riding in the same way that the elite riders do. So uh, on Dressage Training TV membership, we've got um, a course currently running called The How of Riding. Uh, that course is 10 lessons, and each lesson is a breakdown uh, in a lot of detail, so for instance, the first lesson teaches you about alignment, about neutral spine, about how to solve those kind of problems. It talks about stirrup length, uh, how to get the right stirrup length, where your thigh should be and so on. And lesson two talks about the seat, how to control tempo with your seat and so on. And in fact, the next lesson is on Saturday and that's about rising trot mechanics and how to get really good tempo control when you're doing trot as well. Because, you know, impul in fact, one of our lessons is on impulsion. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, you can't get impulsion if you can't control tempo. So that's kind of one of the things that we sort of build into teaching rise and trot is, you know, how can you control the speed of the horse's legs? Um, we have lots of other courses on dressage training TV too, and we have a new one starting as well, which is, uh, I think it's going to be called Green to Great, which is how to take a young or inexperienced horse through to their first competition. So, uh, you know, there's lots of video on there. I think Claire's put up a link, and if you'd like to find out more about joining dressage training TV and getting access to all these great courses, then you can just follow that link and, and have a look, and there's lots of information there. I will say one thing, um, we've been working on a piece of code for our site which limits subscribers to only seeing content for the month that they've paid for. So kind of that prevents people, um, you know, not subscribing for a whole year and then paying one month and having access to an entire year's worth of courses. Uh, when you first join, you get about uh, 20, 20 something hours worth of existing content, and, and of course, you, you get access, access to the current courses that are running. Uh, now, fortunately, I haven't put that code up yet. Uh, it's taken a while for me to, to figure it out. I am a programmer, so I kind of I do all that sort of thing as, as well as uh, the, the lectures and so on. Uh, but I, I, I shall have that code applied uh, in the next couple of days. So if you join up now, you'll still get access to lessons one and lessons two of the How of Riding, which you know go into neutral spine and stirrup length and how to fix typical problems and the seat and, and how to control your seat bones and walk. And you'll be in time for the lesson on Rising Trot, which is this weekend, and the following weekend is Transitions, both upwards and downwards. So if you go to the to the page that uh, we've set up which describes you know how to join uh, Dressage Training TV, um, if you scroll right down to the bottom of the page, okay, so you know, you'll scroll down the bit where it says uh, monthly subscription or six monthly subscription, uh, past the instructors and keep going down, past the pictures which uh, you know we've taken from some of the different um, courses that there are, right at the bottom, you'll see a, uh, the Harry Hall logo. And what Harry Hall have said is uh, they will give you 25% off from their shop uh, on any purchases over £20 if you use the, the coupon code DOVE25. So I've put all that right on that page. So uh, we'll leave it up for a while. We'll leave it up during the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, so you should be able to click on it and you know, uh, scroll to the bottom and all the information's there and you can save yourself 25% on Harry Hall clothing from their shop. Don't go and buy it from my shop because the code won't work. Uh, but the link to their shop is also there too. So Charlotte and Rachel have asked, how do you kind of stop yourself going to the, the fetal position? Well, I think 
uh, and this is, you know, what happened to uh, Gail Ann as well, is you need to be already prepared. You already need to be thinking about engaging your core, having your thigh out in front of you, monitoring the angle here, making sure you're breathing correctly, your shoulders are back in place, and you are kind of in a state of red alert, I guess, if you like. You know, you're already prepared and in a firm place. And, you know, when uh, something worrying happens, just keep checking in with yourself. Are you still bearing down? Are you still breathing? Do your thighs stay out in front of you? Do you have this angle open? And, you know, kind of what happened to, to Gail Ann is, you know, the horse went to plunge um, and, and literally he went dunk and kind of hit the end of the rain. And, you know, that was because Gail Ann was already practicing doing these things. If you sit up there unprepared, waiting for something to happen, then it will catch you unawares. You know, as, as in, you know, if you're if you're too loose in your position, if you're too easily moved around, uh, then you're kind of at the mercy of whatever the horse throws at you. You know, this is one of the reasons why I don't really understand the idea of uh, people saying relax. You know, I'd be kind of like. Which bits should I relax? When should I relax? How should I relax it? Do Am I relaxed through the entirety of my body? And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, when I watch elite riders, the answer is no, they are not relaxed. They are highly toned athletes and they are stable under all kinds of situations. So, you know, as a nervous rider, the best thing is to breathe, improve your skill, improve your stability because that will give you a lot of confidence in and of itself and I've seen that happen uh, over and over again with people that I've taught who are nervous that uh, they improve their skill they learn how to engage their core they learn how to become more stable and it makes them so much more confident uh, especially when you know things like that happen to Gail Ann they suddenly go wow I wasn't budged I wasn't moved you know the horse didn't get get me as it were <laughs> not that horses are out to get us but I think you understand. Um, and we got any more questions? So, so, so Mary and Dawn and quite a few people are asking, uh, you know, are there any off horse exercises you can do? Uh, so one of the courses that we've got running uh, at the moment, which is on Dressage Training TV, and again, if, you, if you're getting in before like the next couple of days, uh, you'll have access to that. There is a uh, Dressage Yoga course and uh, that is really, really good, good for building up your core. I mean, some of the exercise, all of the yoga exercises you're doing there are engaging your core. And uh, Demel's a horse who's running the course. Uh, she's a PSG rider and, um, you know, she, she's, she looks great up on the horse. You know, she's really stable uh, and dynamic. So, you know, that, that really works. Pilates uh, works. You know, uh, some, some Pilates instructors, uh, I think, uh, for riding, you know, emphasize pulling uh, the, uh, too much in towards the spine. Uh, whereas actually bearing down and, and engaging your core for riding requires that little bit more of you pull your guts in to make a wall, but you push your guts against the wall, okay? Because if you're kind of just pulling inwards, you could end up back in the same situation where you tip forwards. So uh, dressage, yoga is, uh, the dressage yoga is great. Um, Pilates is really good. And, um, you know, I actually go to, uh, I use another site called beachbody.co.uk uh, to, they have tons of programs for improving your core. Uh, you can do things like just, uh, so if you watch lesson one, sorry, if you watch lesson two, it teaches you about bearing down. Well, I bear down all the time, you know, like if, I, if I'm walking around, I'll bear down. If I'm, if I'm brushing the yard, I have to bear down because you as you push the broom, you, you have to bear down. So, you know, when I drive, I think about bearing down and that in of itself builds up tone and actually kind of gets you used to engaging your core because some of it is getting used to doing that and then learning how to breathe and you know i've been rabbiting on to you all this time and i've been you know bearing down and engaging my core the entire time so it just takes a little bit of practice and you know uh when you're on the horse and you're in a dynamic situation it doesn't feel as forced as you know when you just sat here generating all this energy because you know i can tell you as soon as i start bearing down and engaging my core i start to heat up and, and it's actually 
It's a great way to burn ca extra calories as you're, as you're doing your jobs or walking about. You know, if you've got an office job and you get up and you walk somewhere, bear down all the way, you know, engage your core all the way. Other questions? You know, I think I think one of the things, so the question was, you know, if you've got an upward transition from trot to canter and you tend to pitch forward in that upward transition, which, which is easily done, um, you know, if, if, you, if you're using aids where you bring your outside leg back, well, you're kind of doing the whole um, rotate about the thigh and, and end up throwing yourself um, throwing yourself forward and you know I, I teach outside leg back to, to uh, ask the horse to canter and you know when you see uh, talented riders riding and they're doing flying changes you know the legs go back so the thing is uh, and I, I do this little exercise um, when I'm teaching people good transitions from trot to canter and what I'll say to them is uh, go sitting trot get yourself in place monitor your angles and then on top of that apply the aids to canter and what you're trying to do is run a little experiment in your head can you keep thinking about your angles and your thigh being out in front of you and engaging your core as you give the aids to canter what tends to happen is people go sitting to a, and canter and they kind of throw everything to asking the horse to canter it, it's like it's a big deal they've made it a big deal inside of their minds and this idea of treating it like an experiment uh, regardless of the outcome it's almost like um, you know you're going to do this experiment whether the horse canters or not from your aids and and the result is not getting the strike off but the result is can i Keep thighs in slingshot, keep bearing down, keep these angles the same, keep my hands up in front of me, and at the same time, give the aids for canter. And it, be aware if the outside leg comes back, you know, you, you may be opening this angle more as you give the aid with the leg. So treat it a bit more like an experiment. Don't be so, so kind of uh, focused on the result, which is the canter strike off, but much more on the process of, of how you do it. So, you know, just disassoci disassociating the result can often help. You know, most riders that throw themselves around and canter are doing it because they are trying too hard and focusing on making the canter happen rather than getting their body in the right place. Look at it this way. Um, we don't influence the horse through magic. You know, we apply, w the horse responds to our body. So the question really is, what are you going to focus on? Well, you don't want to focus on what it is that you want the horse to do. You focus on what is it that you have to do to make that happen. So a lot of riders, their focus is on the horse and on the result rather than what is it I'm doing with my body? Uh, what is happening to me when I canter? And again, you know, uh, if you do throw yourself forward, figure out how you throw yourself forward. Does the thigh get vertical? Do you close the angle here? You know, uh, do you crumple in the front? What what is happening now? Because until you know what's happening now, you won't be able to change it. You you know, you have to know what's going on, and then you can make the changes. How are we doing for questions? Uh, Woo! More questions. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's an interesting question. Nothing to do with tipping forwards, but um, what was the name, Dawn? Yeah. So Dawn was saying. Um, how do you use the side of your calf rather than your heel to kick? Okay, all righty. So um, although there isn't anything to do with tipping forwards, we will answer that one. And uh, that uh, I think we talked about that in lesson two in the How of Riding. Um, so basically, when you use your leg, the typical problem people have is they kick backwards or they use their heel or they start to, um, you know, wiggle and move the whole leg around. When you see a good rider give a leg aid, if you see a good rider give a leg aid, and actually I'll try and stand up as I do this, what you should see happen is, and if I can do it like this, this is a big aid, so the leg would do this, and it literally comes out and in, and then on a more uh, advanced horse that is much more sensitive, the leg, and you probably hardly see the leg move there, there's a contraction inwards of the lower leg um, and you know the um, let me just get myself sat down here uh, the important thing is is to imagine what will help you is to imagine the whole leg is like a wooden boot okay you, there's no flexibility there's nothing going to happen with the heels or anything like that you're, you're to think of 
the whole leg being there, and as if you want to slap the stirrup iron underneath the horse's belly, like this. The leg comes inwards. There's no coming back, there's no wiggle, there's nothing like that. Just literally inwards with the leg. Forwards. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay, so, so and, and actually, hey, try, try it on your chair. So, so sit yourselves further forward on your chair. Uh, get your seat bones on the edge of your chair. And, and try and get yourself in, in a kind of almost uh, on-horse position. And if you feel like your heel is like on one of the chair legs or, or your ankle there, just think of kind of banging inwards like that. It is literally just in. And the, the toe doesn't turn out. And, and, and you know, if you, are, if you are using your heel to ask the horse to go on, just imagine if you were to have to wear a spur. And you'd be a basically applying spur without meaning to. So the only time the heel should ever rotate in is if you were going to use a spur. But uh, generally, toes stay pointing forwards, and it's kind of like a, an inward slap of the stirrup iron. And you need to feel as though you allow the leg to rebound off a little. You know, don't kind of go... <coughs> and get stuck and as if you're trying to squeeze the horse's innards out. It literally is a short, clear aid that the horse will then respond to. Okay, question? So Jelaine is talking about, um, she, her, she feels like her lower back is fairly straight, but uh, she's rounded at the top. And you know, and, th and that can happen. And she says when she gets it right, it feels really strange and stiff. Uh, so, you know, I think my answer to that is it might do, it might feel strange and stiff because all your body's telling you is this is very different and I'm stretching all my muscles and it's really hard. And that's pretty much what your body's going to be telling you. And you w you may have to feel really strange. If you, best thing to do is, uh, I think I forgot to say it at the beginning, but the best thing to do is get a photo, get a video, get in front of a mirror, ask a friend, and you know, get a picture taken so you can see if you're like this, you know, you're going to have to bring the shoulder blades back and close together. You're probably going to have to think of lifting your sternum up a bit like this. Your shoulder blades come back together. You're going to have to feel probably like, by the way, I, I have this problem uh, of, of uh, rounding. Um, you actually probably have to feel like you're shortening the entire muscle chain down the back. Not like this, you're not trying to hollow, but it just feels as though everything's pulling down and back to connect your shoulders with the back of the seat almost, uh, and that the elbows must be out here. So this is pretty tricky. <laughs> um, but yeah, it could end up feeling really strange. And again, that's often one of the reasons why people don't make the kind of progress that they could is because their body's saying to them, this can't be right or this feels really weird. Now, I'm not saying your correction that you make is is the right one, but um, best thing is get, it, get a picture taken of it. And uh, it's, it's not always wise to trust your body. Best to trust a mirror or a photograph. Yeah, I, I have, by the way, I have this as well. Um, I know about things being weird. You know, I know that uh, when you change something in your body um, that it's going to feel weird. And yet, you know, I've been on a course with Mary and Mary's saying, uh, push the inside uh, elbow forwards. You know, like my left hand wants to be a little bit further beh behind. Push the left side forward. And she's saying more. And I'm in my mind going, you've got to be kidding me. And, and I know she's not kidding. And Mary doesn't exaggerate things. You know, she sort of gets you into the right place. She doesn't make you ever exaggerate. I totally trust it. And you can see it on the, the video. But even I kind of sometimes go, you're kidding me. Um, as, as you could just can't trust your body. You know, it's just saying, this is really weird. This is really different. Another question? Okay, so, so um, a lot of people are asking for me to repeat the slingshot explanation. And what I might do is, I'm, um, can you zoom the camera out a little bit so I can stand up rather than sit down? It might be a little bit easier if I put myself on a non-horse position. So you can do this sat on your chair, but imagine you were to try and get your knees closer down towards the floor, really stretching the knee down and away from you. And I don't mean vertically down, but you're kind of as if you were trying to push them uh, down towards the horse's front feet. If you were to do that, it's quite possible you could end up with your seat like this and your thigh too far out in front of you. Now go the opposite way and feel as though you're trying to pull your seat bones back along your flesh and you're kind of almost making yourself duck butt, <laughs> I suppose, seat t stuck out behind you. So that's the opposite, you know, one way we're pushing the knee down like this and out in front of us and another way we're bringing the knee back and the seat bones back. Now, 
rather like this idea of a slingshot uh, where your thighs are kind of like the elastic on a, on a catapult and your knees are the, the two kind of uh, the V shape that kind of comes up and the pouch is your seat bones. Try and get a sense that you reach away with the thigh at the same time as pulling back with the seat bones. And as I do that, I can feel the opposing forces uh, generate a lot of tone in my thigh. And that really keeps me very stable back behind my thigh. If I let go, ugh, I can end up being like this. But having the thigh out in front, and by the way, <laughs> whew, doing that is a really good exercise. <laughs> Just standing there in on-horse position, getting the feeling as though you're reaching the thigh away, but you're pulling back. Another way of thinking about it actually is if someone put a piece of string around here or a rope and you know this actually is a good way to get someone to um, get you used to the feeling pulled around and they're trying to pull you back and you're trying to kind of resist and then imagine what it feels like if they take that rope away can you keep that same feeling of resistance that activates your thigh muscles keeps them out in front of you and stops you from going over your thighs or stops your thighs getting too uh, vertical like this. So that's kind of slingshot. And you know, slingshot's quite a useful tool in all sorts of situations. You know, um, slingshot can be used to bring the horse more up off its forehand. It can be used to get the horse to sit more. It can be used to help you control tempo. It can, um, gosh, I'm slightly out of breath. Uh, <laughs> it can also help you, um, you know, to to keep yourself in balance when a, you've got a horse that's trying to run away from you um, and you know you don't get pulled forward by it uh, it's really helpful in downward transitions that you can just stay thigh out in front in slingshot and in, in a really good place so slingshot bearing down monitoring your angles all very useful anything else so um, I, I think actually when when uh, Mary first term this. Uh, it was a term used uh, in childbirth when you were engaging and pushing the baby out. Um, but, you know, Mary does then use the term, you know, bear out, uh, bear forward. And it really is the feeling that you pull your guts in to make a wall and you push your guts out against the wall and you'll feel the entirety of your front engage. Um, and, and, and really, when you do it right, it activates the muscles on the front of your body and the muscles in the back of your body as well. Okay, so uh, Melita, did you say? Melita is sort of saying that she tends to pinch with her knees. And, and you know, if you do pinch in with your knees, that could very, very easily start to close up the whole uh, front ankle of the body, front angle of the body. You know, you know, I teach that the thigh should be snug against the saddle, but that doesn't mean to say uh, the knees should pinch in. So the kind of snugness is more at the top of the thigh going on the, on the way down and some saddles may or may not allow the knee to pinch. Um, another little bit of advice uh, is if you find your knees coming up, if you find that kind of thing happening, just think of uh, the muscle at the back of your thigh shortening and pulling the knee more down away from you that might help keep the knee down reached away from you. The only issue is, is the angle in the front of the body likes to stay the same. So I've seen this happen. I've seen a person go from upright with their thigh to out in front to the thigh correct, but they're tipping forwards. And, you know, um, what you might have to do is you shorten here. You have to make sure that you keep the angle in the, in the front of the thigh open so that, you know, the knee goes down and away from you and doesn't pinch up, but you then don't get um, pitched forwards by it. Okay, so I think we'll wrap up there. Uh, it looks like with the questions we could keep going forever. <laughs> um, so thank you very much for joining. Um, there will be a replay for this at some point. You'll, I think you'll get an email if you want to go back over it, so you'll still be able to get access to it. Follow the link through to the sign-up. Scroll all the way down to the bottom, and there is that um, coupon code to Harry Hall, and uh, that's if you spend more than £20. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, I hope that was helpful and you got a lot out of it. So um, thanks very much, and no doubt we'll speak again soon.